Grace to you and peace in the name of God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer. It is hard to believe we have been doing this for 52 weeks. But by God's grace, we have been able to do it together. And though our pews have been empty, our church has remained full. And on this day when we mark a strange anniversary, we give thanks to each of you and for each of you. So whether you're tuning in today via the live stream on your screen or listening on the phone or the radio or watching sometime in the future, we are so grateful for you and will continue to be praying with you and for you during this time. Today we will be finding ways to honor this occasion, to mark this moment. And so wherever you are, I invite you to stand and join me, if you are able, in our prayer of remembrance. We light this first candle in remembrance of the lives lost to COVID-19. In our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world. May the light of Christ overwhelm the darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Let us pray. God of grace, you meet us in our time of need. Without you, we were mired in our troubles. 
We grew ill in our sinful ways. When we cried out to you, you heard us and you saved us from our distress. Increase our faith in your power to save us from destruction. Beloved friends, hear the good news. God sent Jesus into the world not to condemn, but to give life. The one who comes from above saves us from death and leads us into new and eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. We light this second candle to acknowledge all the losses we have experienced. Jobs, birthdays, graduations, weddings, goodbyes, funerals, friendships, and connections. May the light of Christ renew our souls. God calls us out of darkness and into the light. One of the things that has been a little different this year is that we haven't been able to do baptisms in person during the service itself. We've had to rethink theologically who we are and what this means. And what we've realized is that baptism is more than the moment in which the water is placed on the child or adult's head, but it's that moment when the entire community commits to walk alongside that child. And so, as we have been doing throughout this year, we now bring forward a child for baptism as recorded yesterday. Dearly beloved, Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which grace we become partakers of his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place amongst the people of God, which holy privilege must not be denied them. Do you, in presenting your child for baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before him a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all godly care, that he be brought up in the Christian faith, be taught the Holy Scriptures, and learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? And will you endeavor to keep him under the ministry and guidance of the church, until he, by the power of God, shall accept for himself the gift of salvation and be confirmed as a full and responsible member of Christ's holy church. And I invite you forward at this time.
автоматически она дарит. And by what name shall this child be baptized? Fletcher Matthew. I baptize you today in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I mark you this day before God and neighbor as a child of God. Isn't that water? Yeah. So this is typically the moment when I would walk Fletcher down the aisle and I would introduce you to all of the people who are here to support you. And I would remind you that all these people are there so that if you stumble or if you fall, as we all do from time to time, we are committing today to be there to help pick you up again. But we're also asking that if we stumble or if we fall, as even the best among us do, then just maybe you'll be there to help pick us up so that we might learn from you as you learn from us. But here's the thing, we don't see anybody out there today and we can't see all the people. But that's sometimes how life is, Fletcher. Sometimes we can't see the people who are there to support us. But we trust by God's grace that they are there. And I know that they are there for you here today. And so wherever you are out there, I'd ask that you stand, if you are able, that we might commit to Fletcher as his parents are committing to us and as Fletcher is coming alongside us. And so, friends of the household of faith, will you, with God's help, so order your lives after the example of Christ that this child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal? We will. Let us pray. O oh God, grant that Fletcher, as he grows in years, may also grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So guide and uphold Eilish and Matt, that by loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, they may be each led into the life of faith whose strength is righteousness and whose, <laughs> and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Of course, one of the other things that has changed this year has been that we miss certain faces throughout the course of our week and throughout the course of the year reading scripture lessons for us. And so the very first person we asked to read a remote scripture lesson for us has graciously agreed to do so again today. And so I turn it to Sean Mahan, who has our scripture lesson for today. The scripture reading this morning is from the book John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world 
and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and he loves you too, and so do we. Good morning, my friends. I'm going to start the day with something I'm sure you love. How about a math lesson? Come on, let's do some math. All right. I have a series here of five numbers, and your goal is to find out what they all have in common. And as soon as you know, just shout it out, okay? The first number is the number four. All right. The next is the number 52. Now, this next number, if I have any musical theater friends, this might give it away. 525,600. That number might be familiar. And then, how about the number 365? And lastly, the number one. What do they all have in common? They measure a year, the time it takes for the Earth to get around the sun. And we're measuring a year today. It's been a very hard year, a sad year, a year with both a darkness and light. As Sean so beautifully did read the scripture, he talked about darkness and light. And in our dark moments, when we feel scared, lonely, unsure of what tomorrow is going to bring, God is there. And in the light moments, the moments of love and joy, God is there. I want to share with you a small little video of moments of God's love and light. It's just a combination of the 52 children's moments that we have celebrated together. So why don't you watch it with me?
my friends, as that song goes, those moments are measured in love. And one of the miracles of this year is though you are not physically here, we feel the love coming from you. And we hope that the love we send through the camera to your screen, you feel that as well. And that happens because God is present with us, both here at church and here in your home. Let's take a moment and thank God for that, and then we'll go and close with the Lord's Prayer. So bow your heads. Dear God, we thank you that in those dark moments, we are not alone. You are with us. And when we thank you also for that love and light that you shine on us every Sunday morning here at church and in our friends' homes, thank you for being with us this long, hard year and be with us as the new year continues. And then we'll say the prayer that Jesus taught his friends and we keep on saying it today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, the power and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. We light this third candle to honor all of those we have leaned on this year. We've just seen one. Medical workers, educators, scientists, essential workers, IT professionals, leaders, loved ones. May the light of Christ sustain us. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that all who believe in him may have eternal life. Some changes in life arrive relatively slowly, almost imperceptible one day to the next, but given time, become clear. Our uncreased skin at birth, given time, marks our age. That stream that meanders through the landscape, given time, can carve out a canyon. The clothes that we wear today, given time, will wash away with the tide of fashion. Some of us are already there. <laughs> and while day by day, moment by moment, we might not be able to see the change, we might not even know that it's happening. It is. Which means, of course, that unless we make some heroic effort to the contrary, unless we make a conscious stand against whatever change we are facing, most of us are just pulled along with the current, slowly adapting to the ever-changing world for better or worse. We might be surprised by what we can adapt to if it comes on slowly enough. Only not every change comes on slowly. No, some change comes on so quickly it can give us whiplash. One day the world looks this way and the next day it doesn't. And while chances are high, most of us have experienced that as individuals in that moment after that phone call, that diagnosis, that accident, that discovery. One year ago, we all experienced it together, a sudden and abrupt change. One day we could be with friends and neighbors, go to work and school in person, sit in our own sanctuary for worship, and the next day, we couldn't. We hadn't planned on it. It wasn't in any memo. We didn't have it in our strategic plan. I checked. And worse, we couldn't do anything to avoid it. We couldn't delay it for another year. We couldn't ask for an extension. No, friends, the truth is when change came, we just had to change, to turn our attention away from whatever had occupied our time, our effort and energy, and toward that most basic human instinct of all, survival. When the world changed, we just looked to survive. We did our very best to turn in the direction of life. Or at least we tried. What did that turn look like for you? What does it look like now? It's hard to believe that it's been one year. In some ways, it feels like it's been the longest year of our lives. And in some ways, it feels like it has just gone by so quickly. You know, now that we've been through it, of course, looking back, it's hard to remember just how that, those first few days felt. 
There was a visceral, palpable change in the air, and we did not know what to do with it. We were uncertain and scared. The medical professionals hadn't yet figured out exactly how this virus spread. We hadn't yet figured out what we needed to do, what we could and what we shouldn't do. We hadn't yet figured out how to fully treat it. And in other words, we were just scared. We kept going back into that very basic human response, that evolutionary response, fight, flight, freeze, fight, flight, freeze, fight, flight, freeze. Maybe some of us feel like we're still there. The point is, we all reacted differently. We do to change. And while some went straight for the toilet paper hoarding, first things first, others of us recognized pretty early on that we were going to need to grab on to some anchor in the midst of this tempestuous storm. We needed something that was going to ground us, some beacon of light. Some of us recognized that we needed to turn toward life. Or at least try. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. As we've shared, this marks our one-year anniversary, 525,600 minutes in. This marks our one-year anniversary, and I pray the last one of virtual-only worship at Asbury First. The first time in 200 years, and I pray the last time. Okay, yes, some out there will remember that that very first Sunday, March 15th, beware the Ides of March, we did have a few people in our sanctuary with us. I think the number was somewhere around 16. We had convinced most people to stay away, but hadn't yet closed down fully. But every week since then, for 52 weeks, these pews have remained empty. And yet somehow, almost miraculously, the, the church has remained full, and in some ways fuller than we were ever before. We now have people who come to us from all over the world. We now have more people worshiping with us on any given Sunday than even the biggest Sundays in the years before. We now have a congregation with, filled with people that we have never met, whose faces we have never and might not ever see, and yet who are a part of us. We've had people tune in from 50 states, thank you, Montana, and over 30 countries who found this place as their church home. People have turned to their screens and to their televisions and to their phones and to their devices in a way we had never before imagined. We have grown in this time. Maybe I should tell people to stay away from church more often. As I said, in, in those first few weeks of the pandemic, I'm much more used to people being here and not listening than people not being here and listening. But friends, the truth is, I get it. I, too, have needed something to ground me in this time. I, too, have needed to reach out and hold on to something. It makes sense, doesn't it? Nothing like a little global pandemic for an existential reality check. When we're confronted daily with our own mortality, when all of those usual things we use to distract us from the reality of life and death are taken away, we need something to hold on to. We need something to anchor us in the storm, some beacon of light. We need something to point us in the direction of life. Historically, of course, we haven't always been great at that, have we? We look for love in all the wrong places. We like those quick fixes, those things that'll make us feel good for a moment, sex, money, drugs, alcohol. We know those things, don't we? Only in the end, so many of them don't have any life to give us. And so we find ourselves empty and still searching. And maybe that changed over time, but the truth is it's been happening for quite some time. Just look at, look at the ancient world and snakes. Yeah, you heard me right, the ancient world and snakes. It's hard to believe 
Strange as it may seem, but for so many centuries in the ancient world, people believed that snakes had the power to heal, to bring life. We don't quite know how it started, given that snake bites are generally considered a bad thing, even the non-poisonous kind. Our best guess is that maybe because snakes shed their skin, people saw them as a symbol for new life. What we do know is that throughout the ancient world, there are constant stories of people who looked towards snakes when they needed healing, when they needed to find life. In ancient Greek culture, there are stories of snakes and healing. In the Roman culture, there were snakes, the stories of snakes and healing. Even in our own history, even in our own tradition, there are stories of snakes and healing. We hear one hinted at in the lesson for today. Maybe you remember that passage from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, in which Moses and the Hebrew people are wandering the desert. And the Hebrew people keep finding themselves being bitten by poisonous snakes. And so they turn to Moses for help. And so Moses holds up a pole with, you guessed it, a snake on it, a bronze serpent, and telling them anyone who looks at the serpent will live. He held up his staff with a serpent on it and promised that anyone who looked at it would live. And while we scratch our heads and scoff, thinking to ourselves, silly ancient people, we sometimes forget that to this very day, the symbol we use for our medical profession is a staff with two intertwined serpents. It is so easy to look for life from places that don't have it to offer. There's no shortage of people offering things that we can grasp onto, that promise us life that they just don't have to give. And the challenge, as we know, is that if we invest too much of our time and effort and energy in those things, if we put too much of ourselves into those things that promise life that they don't have to give, Just like the snakes, it will come back to bite us in the end. So the question is, friends, where do we turn for life? When the storm rolls in and everything seems to be falling apart, when that change comes, where do we look for life? That is the Christian question, isn't it? That's why we're here, or there and here. That's part of what the church is. Look, the church doesn't have it all figured out. We don't have it all figured out. We are imperfect people recognizing that we are more perfect together than we are apart. But we do know this, that our job is to stand with one another in the storms of life, whether it's fast changing or it comes on suddenly, and keep pointing each other in the direction of life. We're here to keep reminding each other that there is a kind of life out there that not even death can destroy. A kind of life that whether this is our first Sunday or our last, we can still grasp onto. A kind of life promised by Jesus Christ. If you have heard nothing else in this entire year from me, if you have ignored basically everything I've said, I don't blame you. If you have not heard anything else, I hope you hear this. The promise of our faith the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope that we come to daily proclaim is that there is life out there, and here's how you get it, through love. The gospel in four words, love leads to life. Everything else can go away, but that is what we believe. That is the gospel in miniature. That is who we are. The more we love, the closer we come towards life. If we find ourselves lost, if we find ourselves stuck, we need only turn in the direction of love and we will find life. We've discovered that this year, haven't we? Look at all the ways that we have reached out to one another. Look at all the ways that we have done our best to overcome that distance. Look at all the ways that we have tried to help and look at what we have discovered along the way. Let us not lose that. 
There are other, of course, miniature gospels out there. We hear one in our passage for today, John 3.16. You may recognize it from stadiums and concert halls or bumper stickers. People put it out there thinking it says everything. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And they typically stop there. They shake their finger. They use it too often as a bludgeon against people who are struggling with their faith or struggling to understand it. They use it as a warning about what might happen to you if you die with, before believing in Jesus Christ. But the point is the exact opposite. We forget the next, very next verse. God did not send God's Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The world, it's hard to get bigger than that. Friends, the entire point of this is a warning, not about what happens when we die, about what happens when we fail to live and how easy it is to turn in directions that ultimately cannot give us life. But the good news is we know where to turn. See, John was writing this passage, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus to a people who had just watched their entire world turned up upside down, who had been kicked out of their synagogue, who could no longer be close to the people that they were close to before, who no longer believed that Jesus was coming back any moment and suddenly had to figure out what to do with their faith. And John was trying to tell them in this passage, just keep turning in the direction of life. You know how to do it. Friends, by God's grace, it feels as though we are coming near the end of this pandemic. I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen? You never know what a day is going to bring, but it feels like we're inching our way closer to this pandemic. And while the change that we've just experienced was made for us, now it's our turn to choose the change going forward. It's our turn to make those changes in our life that allow us to love a little bit better. Sure, we could just go back to how it was before, bowing down to the tyranny of our schedules. Who knows, maybe there are those out there who found life in that space between soccer practice and piano, between the sales pitch and the ski slope. But not all of us. This is a chance to make a change for the better, to have taken away something from this moment and to have reminded ourselves of what life could, what life should be. And so, friends, if you, upon looking at your life, recognize that there might be something that you need to change to be a little more loving, no time like the present. The good news is change doesn't always just happen in a snap. If it's scary to think about just changing it tomorrow, maybe we could each start by making one of those slow changes, those kinds that are almost imperceptible day by day, but given time, become clear. Because if we could each do that, friends, day by day, making a slight choice, a different choice, a better choice to turn in the direction of life through love. We might be surprised by where we end up in a year. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it is that things can change. And if we're willing to help them change for the better, then heaven forbid the next time our world gets turned upside down and change comes one day to the next, people will already know in which direction to turn. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have life eternal. May it be so. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, we open our hearts to you. Hear our prayers. We lift to you all of those who are suffering this day, every person on this earth, each of your children. We ask that you wrap your gentle, tender arms around them. Comfort their hearts with your peace. Strengthen them for the healing they need. We thank you for all who have worked tirelessly in this past year, all medical professionals, all neighbors, all delivery folks and store clerks, all who have reached out to the lost and the lonely in this time of isolation. As our minds race with the possibilities of returning to activities we fondly remember, temper our eagerness with wisdom. Instill in us a deep respect for others and for ourselves. Keep us mindful of safety within freedom. Our hearts are ready to embrace new beginnings. Guide us to the place where we can reclaim the goodness of once, what once was. Honor and keep what is in our present and lift our eyes and minds to what can be as we focus ourselves through Christ in light and always living with love as our being. Amen. Amen. We light this fourth candle to recognize all that we have gained this year, new skills, new perspective, gratitude, conviction, insight, empathy, and time. May the light of Christ create in us a heart of gratitude. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. We long to continue to hold you in our prayers, despite the distance in the moment. So if you have particular prayers that we'd like to lift up for us to hold, please let us know. You can email prayers at asburyfirst.org so that we can share in those prayers with you. We also recognize that there are so many watching with us right now. As of this moment, there are 587 devices watching. How many people behind those? It is always hard to tell, but representing in this moment six countries, 33 states and 130 cities from around the world. We say hello to those watching from Singapore, from South Korea, from, Netherland, from the Netherlands, from Canada, from India. We say hello to those watching from Ohio, Florida, Pennsylvania, Texas, Virginia, New Jersey, California, Maryland, Arizona, Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota, Arkansas, North Carolina, Nebraska, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, South Carolina, Connecticut, Ontario, Georgia, Oklahoma, New Hampshire, Kansas, hi mom and dad, uh, Busan, North Holland, Indiana, and Delaware. Just pause for a moment. Imagine that. All of those people from around the world, and that's just who are watching through our website itself. What a gift 
and what a miracle it is to be able to connect with one another. We would love to know that you're out there, so if you'll take a moment to check in on our website or to text join live to 844-239-5340, we would love to know that you're there. We would also love to have your picture, so if you're willing to take a picture and uh, of yourself watching the service and post it to your social media at hashtag Asbury First at home. We would truly love to see your face as you have had to see mine now for too long. Friends, uh, we recognize in this moment that uh, we want to maintain connections. And so one of the opportunities we've started over this last year is the Fellowship Half Hour. If you would like to be a part of that after the service, we encourage you to do so. There's information on our website about how to join that Zoom so that you can see some of the people who have been worshiping with you face to face. During this Lenten season, we have tried to come up with a challenge each week for people to do. This week, we're asking you to stop for a moment, reflect on this last year, and consider the changes that have happened in your life. And perhaps in so doing, recognizing that there may be some changes you'd like to keep as you move forward. And so, that's your challenge for this week, to pause for a moment and think through those changes and to consider if there are any that you would like to keep. We are gracious for all of the ways that you have supported our mission and ministry as a church through your prayers, through your virtual presence, through your service to us, and through your gifts. If you are able to help support us through a monetary gift today, you can do so by sending in a check, of course, in the mail, or by texting the amount to 206-222-1050 or by simply going to our website, asburyfirst.org slash give. Every gift matters, and it helps us continue to be in ministry with you and with the world. That said, we turn to our offertory anthem.
me start that again with my mic on. We light this final candle in celebration of the new life that has entered our world this year. For the babies born, the friendships made, the connections built, the churches renewed, the resurrection of hope. Christ is the light of the world. Whoever follows Christ will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We close today as we have done so often during this year with the same hymn that I mean every time. God be with you until we meet again. Before the benediction, I want to take one moment of personal privilege to say thank you. This, you may see me and a few others of us up here every Sunday morning, but it takes so many people to make this happen. So to all of those in our tech team, both who come every Sunday, but also who are at home monitoring texts and entering the information so that I can read it out loud to all of those people behind the scenes who help make this possible, those people in front of the scenes who help make this possible, our musicians, the other pastoral team, and to, of course, all of you who tune in to make this worship real. I just want to say thank you. What a gift it is and what a testament it is to God's good grace in our lives. And now take this as a benediction. My life goes on in endless song above earth's lamentations. I hear that still but far off voice that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Amen.